Welcome to the channel. If you're new here and this is your first time, consider subscribing if you enjoy listening to horror stories. Also, please leave a like on today's video before we get started. I upload every single night. Let's begin. In the labyrinth realm of online dating, where swipes and matches ignite virtual connections, I embarked on a journey that would lead me down an unexpected and mortifying path. As a seasoned Tinder user, I had navigated the digital dating landscape with a mixture of excitement and trepidation. The app's promise of endless possibilities had lured me in, but I'd also encountered my fair share of disappointments and awkward encounters. One fateful evening, as I swiped through the sea of profiles, a particular image caught my eye. It was a handsome guy with piercing blue eyes and a disarming smile. His bio hinted at a shared love for adventure and travel. I liked this idea, and with a hopeful heart, I swiped right on him. To my surprise, we matched instantly. I messaged him, and he responded within minutes. His name was Ethan, and he was just as charming and engaging in our virtual conversations as he had seemed in his profile. We exchanged messages for hours, discovering common interests and laughing together over shared experiences. As the night drew to a close, I felt a spark of genuine connection. The next day, Ethan suggested we meet for coffee. I was thrilled, but also kind of nervous. I'd rarely met someone from Tinder in person, and I wanted to make a good impression. I carefully selected an outfit, applied my makeup with precision, and set off for our adventure. As I approached the coffee shop, my heart was pounding with anticipation. I scanned the crowd, searching for a tall, handsome man with piercing blue eyes. Suddenly, my gaze fell upon a familiar face. It was my neighbor's son, David. A wave of embarrassment washed over me. I had matched with my neighbor's son on Tinder. The awkwardness of the situation was almost unbearable. I tried to hide behind my sunglasses, but it was too late. David had already spotted me. With a sheepish grin, he approached my table. Well, <laughs> fancy seeing you here. If it isn't my lovely neighbor. I couldn't help but laugh at the absurdity of it all. David, what are you doing here? I asked, trying to keep my composure. I was just getting a coffee, he replied. I didn't know you used Tinder. I, I don't, I stammered. I just happened to match with you. David raised an eyebrow. Oh really? That's quite a coincidence. I knew I couldn't lie to him. Okay, fine, I admitted. I used Tinder sometimes, but I didn't expect to match with you. David chuckled. Well, I'm glad I did. It's nice to see you outside of our neighborhood. We sat down together and ordered our coffees. The awkwardness gradually dissipated as we talked and laughed. David turned out to be even more charming and witty in person than he had been online. Although he was my neighbor, I only knew him by face value. We would never stop and talk and we barely knew each other's families. As we sipped our drinks, I couldn't help but feel a mix of embarrassment, but also amusement at what had happened. I'd never imagined I would end up on a Tinder date with my neighbor's son. It was a surreal and slightly uncomfortable experience, but it was also strangely exhilarating. We spent the next hour or so chatting and getting to know each other, I discovered that David was a recent college graduate who had just started a new job in the city. 
He was smart, ambitious, and had a great sense of humour. As the coffee shop began to close, we exchanged numbers and promised to stay in touch. I couldn't believe that my embarrassing Tinder encounter had turned into something potentially promising. Over the next few weeks, David and I went on several more dates. The awkwardness of our initial meeting had faded away, and we had grown increasingly comfortable with each other. I found myself drawn to him. However, our relationship was not without its challenges. The fact that we were neighbours added a layer of complexity. I was acutely aware that my parents and his parents would inevitably find out about our dating. I couldn't help but feel that they would be disappointed or even disapproving. One evening, as David and I were watching a movie at my place, my mum and dad were out, but I heard the door open down below. Mum had come home early. My mum came upstairs and knocked on the door. I froze in panic. I couldn't let her see David here. Quick, hide, hide in the bathroom, I whispered to him. David scrambled to his feet and disappeared into the bathroom. I opened the door, trying to act as nonchalantly as possible. Hi mum, what's up? My mum smiled. I just wanted to drop off some baking I made. Do you have a minute? We've had a charity event at work, and I was wondering if you wanted anything. I couldn't refuse, so I invited her in. As we sat in the living room after going downstairs, I could hear David rustling around upstairs in the bathroom. I hoped he wasn't doing anything too embarrassing. My mum chatted with me for a while, and I managed to keep the conversation going without revealing David's presence. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, she got up to leave to go pick Dad up. Well, I'd best go back and pick him up, she said. Have a good night, honey. I'll be back at around 10pm. I walked her to the door and waved goodbye. As soon as she was gone, I rushed to the bathroom and let David out. That was close, he said, with a relieved expression. I know, I replied. I'm just glad she didn't see you. We laughed together at the absurdity of the situation. It was clear that our relationship was going to be filled with both challenges and unexpected moments. As the weeks turned into months, David and I continued to date. We navigated the awkwardness of being neighbours with a surprising amount of ease. Our parents eventually found out about our relationship, and while they were initially surprised, they were ultimately supportive. Our Tinder encounter had blossomed into something unexpected and wonderful. It had taught me that love can be found in the most unlikely of places, and that is always worth taking a chance on something that brings you joy. It was a warm summer's day in South Dakota, and I was eagerly waiting for my boyfriend Reese to pick me up for our date. We had been dating for almost a year, and everything seemed perfect. I'd fallen deeply in love with him, and couldn't imagine my life without him. Little did I know, my world was about to come crashing down. As I waited in front of my house, I saw Reese's car pull up and my heart skipped a beat. I jumped in the passenger seat and gave him a quick kiss, excited for our first date. But as we drove, I noticed something was off. Reese seemed distant and lost in thought. I asked him if everything was okay, but he just brushed it off and said that he was tired from work. We arrived at the restaurant and throughout the whole dinner, Reese seemed distant and uninterested in our conversation. 
I tried to lighten the mood, but he just kept giving one-word answers. I felt like he didn't care anymore, and I was worried and a little hurt by his sudden change in behaviour. After dinner, we went for a walk in the park, our usual routine, but this time, instead of holding my hand like he always did, Reese kept his hands in his pockets. I finally couldn't take it anymore, and asked him what was going on. That's when he dropped the bomb on me. I think we should break up, he said, avoiding eye contact. My heart stopped, and my mind went blank. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. We had never fought, never had any major issues, and suddenly he wanted to end things. I felt like I was in a nightmare, desperately hoping to wake up. Why? What did I do wrong? I managed to choke out, my voice trembling with fear and heartache. Ryan let out a sigh and finally looked at me. I met someone else. Someone who... I just want to be with. Listen, I'm sorry. I felt like my world was crushing down around me. I couldn't believe he would just throw our relationship away for someone else. I was angry, hurt, and confused all at the same time. How could he do this to me? But even with all that pain and anger, I couldn't help but feel a twinge of jealousy towards this other girl. Was she better than me? More beautiful? More fun? These thoughts consumed me as Reese continued to explain how he had been feeling lost in our relationship and how this other girl made him feel alive again. I couldn't take it anymore. I stormed off, tears streaming down my face. I left Reese standing there in the park, all alone. I felt betrayed and heartbroken. I couldn't believe he could just replace me like that. The next few weeks were a blur. I went through the stages of grief, denial, anger, and a whole bunch more stuff, like depression. But finally, I reached the final stage. Acceptance. But even with acceptance, the pain was still there. I couldn't shake off the fact that he had betrayed me and I had so many constant thoughts of Reese with this other girl. I tried to distract myself by hanging out with my friends and focusing on my studies, but every little thing reminded me of Reese. The songs we used to listen to, the places we used to go, even the smell of his cologne that lingered in my room. It was a constant reminder of what I had lost. As much as I tried to move on, I couldn't help the bitterness towards Reese. How could he just move on so quickly while I was still struggling to pick up the pieces of my broken heart? It didn't seem fair. One day, I received a message from a friend saying she had seen Reese out with this other girl. My heart sank and I couldn't resist the urge to drive by the place that she mentioned. And there they were, holding hands and laughing like they were the only two people in the world. I couldn't believe it. He was cheating on me while we were still together. The pain and anger resurfaced, and I felt like I had been stabbed in the heart. I wanted to confront him, to demand an explanation, but I knew it would only lead to more pain and heartache. So, instead, I cut off all contact with Reese and tried my best to move on. It wasn't easy. I would see them together around town, occasionally, once a month, at least, and it would bring back all the hurt and jealousy. But as time went by, I started to heal. I realized that Reese's actions were a reflection of his character, not mine. I deserved someone who would love and cherish me, not someone who could easily replace me. I also learned to let go of my jealousy towards this other girl. I realized that it wasn't about her being better than me. It was about Reese's choice, 
and I was determined to not let his actions define me. As I focused on myself and my own happiness, I started to see the silver lining in this heartbreak. I became more independent, rediscovered my passions, and surrounded myself with people who truly cared about me. I even started dating again. Looking back, I can see how this experience has shaped me into a stronger and more confident person. It taught me that I'm capable of moving on from heartbreak, and that I deserve nothing but the best in a relationship. Reese's betrayal may have caused me a lot of pain, but it also taught me a valuable lesson. To never settle for less than I deserve, and for that, I'm grateful. I may have lost a boyfriend, but I gained so much more. Self-love and self-respect, and that is something no one can take away from me. I sat alone in my apartment, nursing a broken heart. Reese, the man I'd shared the past two years with, was unceremoniously dumped me via text message that afternoon. He had left it this long to officially dump me, and I couldn't actually believe it. I had just began to move on, and he had done something like this, leaving me shattered and lost, and bringing all the memories flooding back. In a desperate attempt to distract myself from the pain, I downloaded Tinder, swiping through the countless profiles. I stumbled upon a photo of a guy. His name was Ethan, and his bio promised adventure and excitement. Driven by a mix of curiosity and desperation, I swiped right. A few weeks later, he ended up matching with me. We only exchanged a few brief messages, and then before I knew it, we were making plans to meet for dinner a couple of evenings later. Fast forward to that evening, I'd actually got over the fact that I would never see Reese again. As I got ready for my first date in years, I just couldn't believe it. Something didn't seem right though, and in the moment, I was so shaken on the fact of getting revenge against Reese that I didn't realize Ethan had been overly eager to meet me and had insisted on picking me up from my own apartment. Despite my reservations, I agreed. When Ethan arrived, I was struck by how good looking he was, but there was something unsettling in his gaze. As we drove to the restaurant, he talked incessantly, his voice a low, monotonous drone. I tried to engage in conversation, but he seemed uninterested in what I had to say. His eyes were darting nervously around the car. At the restaurant, things took an even stranger turn. Ethan ordered a bottle of wine and proceeded to drink it almost entirely by himself. As the alcohol loosened his inhibitions, he became increasingly possessive and demanding. He insisted on me finishing my meal quickly so we could go somewhere more private close brackets. Unease came over me as we left the restaurant and headed back to his place. The once familiar streets seemed sinister in the darkness, and Ethan's driving became reckless. He sped through stop signs, narrowly avoiding oncoming traffic. Ethan, please slow down, I cried, my voice trembling with fear. He ignored me, his eyes fixed on the road ahead. The speedometer needle climbed steadily, and the car lurched violently as he took corners at dangerously high speeds. Pull over, I screamed, but my pleas fell on deaf ears. Suddenly, a pair of flashing blue lights appeared in our rearview mirror. Please, I shouted. Ethan's face turned ashen. He slammed on the brakes, but it was too late. The police car pulled up behind us, and an officer stepped out. His gun drawn. Step out of the vehicle, the officer demanded. Ethan hesitated for a moment, before reaching for the door handle. I fumbled with my seatbelt, 
my heart pounding in my chest. As I unbuckled myself, I caught a glimpse of Ethan's hand. He was clutching something beneath his seat. Drop the weapon, the officer shouted. Ethan's eyes widened in terror. He lunged for the object under the seat, and a deafening round of gunshots echoed through the car. The officer fired, then fired again. I had no idea if I'd been hit. All I could hear was ringing in my ears, and gunshots echoing against the metal. As I looked over, Ethan slumped onto the steering wheel. There was blood pouring out of his body. The police dragged Ethan from the car and handcuffed him. As I stumbled out of the vehicle, I saw that the object he had been reaching for was a gun. The police escorted me to safety and took Ethan into custody. As I stood on the side of the road, my body trembling with shock and fear, I realized that I had narrowly escaped a deadly encounter. In the aftermath of that night, I learned a valuable lesson about trusting my instincts. I had ignored the red flags that had been waving all along, and it had almost cost me my life. From that day forward, I vowed to never put myself in a situation where I felt unsafe or uncomfortable. And as for love, I knew that I would find it again someday, but this time I would be more cautious and discerning. I would never again let my desperation or loneliness cloud my judgement. This story is not about me, it is about my friend. My friend Amy is female, 18. She's quite uncomfortable with sharing this story, so I thought I'd do it for her. Obviously Amy isn't her real name, I'll keep her anonymous for obvious sakes, but I just had to get this out there. I think it would give more awareness to girls especially younger ones who might be eager to jump on Tinder. While dating guys may seem fun, exhilarating, and also worth it, it's also risky, can be dangerous, and even deadly. Obviously stories and cases like this come rarely, but what Amy went through was one of those rare cases, and she of all people didn't expect to have to go through it. Amy matched with a whole bunch of guys on Tinder. Every time she came round my house, she would always show all of the matches. When we were bored, we'd occasionally go through all the guys, stating what we liked about them. Their features, hair, eyes, eyebrows, jaw, their height, even the clothes they were wearing, or what they were doing in the photos. We'd make up stories, try to imagine what type of characters and personalities they were like in real life. It was a fun game, and occasionally, if we were feeling extremely mischievous, we would end up just playing with them, playing pranks, which I'm not too proud of, and most of those times, we were drunk when we did that. The time that Amy matched with this guy, she wasn't with me. She never showed me anything, and she told me after all this had blown over, that she was actively trying to keep him a secret from me. She thought he was the one. The usual tick of every box. Tall, dark, handsome, had a business, and was doing well financially. It turns out most of that was a lie, but Amy being young, just like me, was naive, and fell for all of them. Amy said that she began by calling with this guy. Simple calls turned into flirty calls, and before she knew it, she couldn't wait to get her hands on him. Amy explained him as being alluring, manipulating, but also there was something about him that drew her so close. 
she saw him as a father figure and absolutely loved it. When they first ever met up, Amy was confused why the car he bought wasn't the one in his profile. Obviously we know now, because it was all a complete lie. But at the time, she didn't. He made up a lie saying that his car was being repaired, apparently the engine had broken, and it was at the local mechanics. Amy believed it, and just batted that off as sheer bad luck. They went on the first date in his awful half broken down car, they got food, and then he drove her back home. Amy said that he was just like he was over calls. He was very strong, independent, and a great leader. These were things that Amy was drawn to, as she has daddy issues. After the date, she got back home and started spamming me. I answered her text messages, and then I asked her if she wanted to call. When we called, I tried asking her questions about this date. One of them was, why didn't you tell me you were going on a date? If I'd known where you were, it would have been better, Amy. She just laughed at it, and said, it was all a secret though. Why would I tell you? He's not going to hurt me. We called for another hour or two until it was time for me to get some sleep, as I had college the next morning. Amy continued talking with this guy, and fell more and more closer to him. Eventually, two weeks had passed since their first date, and Amy agreed that she would go on a second one. This time, he picked her up in the exact same car. Amy went on and on about the car, and apparently had a massive argument with him, she caught him out for the fact that he was lying, and that he didn't actually own the car in his profile picture of Tinder. He was lying, and Amy does not like liars, no matter how attractive they are. Apparently they fell out on the second date, but the guy kept on insisting that the car was still being repaired, and it was at the local garage. So, Amy obviously knew he was lying at this point, still gave him the benefit of the doubt. I know I've written this in a way that probably makes Amy sound like some kind of a car addict, or worse, a gold digger, but she was there, and always going on about this, for the valid point of lying. It's important to note here that she's not a gold digger over a Mercedes, but rather someone trying to figure out if she's been lied to. The third date, is when I all of a sudden got the call. I didn't know what to expect here, and I'd forgotten about Amy and this creepy weird guy she had been dating. That was until one night I got a call from her. It was a Wednesday. It was two o'clock in the morning. Amy never called me in the morning. Once I woke up and saw it was her calling, I immediately sat up in bed, positioned my body, and answered the phone. I could hear her, she sounded as if she was outside as the wind was blowing against her phone's microphone. She was breathing pretty heavy, but the signal kept cutting out. I tried talking to her, but every time I could hear her voice, I would only ever hear one word, and then the call would fuck up. After this, the call just lost signal, and either she hung up on me, or the signal got lost and ended the call for us. I tried to call her back all night long. I even tried calling her sister, who went into her room and said that she wasn't there. When her sister told me this, I immediately told her sister and family to call the cops, which is what they did. The only problem was, none of us could get hold of Amy, because her phone had no signal, or it had now died. Every time we tried to ring it, it wouldn't even go through, it wouldn't connect. It was as if the phone was on airplane mode, or had been completely turned off. This whole time, Amy spent four hours getting home. What had happened, you might ask? Well, it turns out on the third date, the guy turned up again in the shit car, promising that it would be the Mercedes. Amy confronted him again, but this time, the guy had a completely different plan for the date. Instead, 
pissed off that he had been held accountable for lying, he decided to drive Amy, as deep as he possibly could, into the middle of nowhere, and then drop her off. So, as you can imagine, that explains why the signal at the phone wasn't working. He dropped her off 8 miles away from where she lived, and 4 miles from the nearest town. Basically, slumped her in the middle of some farmland, on the edge of a couple of forests and national parks. Then he drove all the way back to his house, and no witnesses saw anything, because after the date, it was gone midnight, and out that way, no one really drives around, apart from locals and farmers, who don't drive at those times of night. Amy took around four to six hours to walk all the way home. She eventually made it back. She was in tears, pieces, and an emotional wreck. Physically, she was unharmed though, and other than being extremely thirsty, sleep deprived, and a little traumatized from walking around in the dark, not knowing where to go, she somehow made it back. I was more impressed at how she made it back. How did she remember where to go, and how did she figure which direction would head nearer to the town? Amy said that after an hour or two of walking, she started to remember some of the roads that she was coming across. There were no people driving by these roads at this time of night, otherwise she would have asked for help. However, this would have also been a huge risk, and possibly extremely dangerous too. I'm glad that Amy's safe and the guy did end up getting caught for what he did. He was given a warning, which I don't think was enough, but when he was actually looked at, arrested and questioned, him and his attorneys said that Amy had asked to be dropped off because she felt uncomfortable. Amy denied this, and I believe Amy, of course, she's been my friend for years. The guy clearly had no evidence for him, or against his point, so the case was dropped, and all this was over him lying about having a Mercedes. Oh boy, insecure little boys do make me laugh, but I don't laugh when they try to mess with my friend. Since this day, Amy promised me to always keep me updated with any date she goes on. She has her location turned on on Snap Maps, so I know everywhere she goes. This is now a must, a promise that I got from her, because let's be real, she was stupid going on that third date, the second that she saw his old banger pull up outside her house, but she still did it. She liked him for who he was, but the fact he lied, she simply couldn't live with that, and I totally get her. In the sun-drenched metropolis of Miami, where the ocean breeze whispered promises of endless summers and the city's vibrant rhythm pulsated through my veins, I'd always felt a sense of belonging, but like a sudden storm that sweeps away serenity, my life took an unexpected turn when my father uttered words that shattered my world. We have to move he said, his voice heavy, with a weight he had never carried before. I lost my job. In that instant, the familiarity of the existence unraveled. The apartment we had called home for years, the friends I had made in the bustling streets, and the dreams I had woven within those walls all seemed to vanish into thin air. The destination of our move was a far cry from the tropical paradise of Miami. It was a small town in the heart of America, where poverty was rampant, and it covered all over the lives of its inhabitants. As we drove through the desolate streets, 
lined with debilitated houses, shuttered businesses, and a wave of unease over every person that walked by. Our new home was a modish trailer, perched precariously on a patch of barren land. The interior was cramped and sparsely furnished, a stark contrast to the spacious apartment we had left behind. The air was thick with the smell of stale tobacco and something indefinable that made my stomach turn. As I explored my new surroundings, I felt a profound sense of isolation. The girls at the local school seemed to be from a different world, their conversations revolving around gossip and petty rivalries. They whispered behind my back, their words like tiny daggers piercing my heart. The adults were no better. They were suspicious of us, outsiders who had come to disturb the uneasy equilibrium of their town. They would stare at us with a mixture of curiosity and contempt making me feel like an alien in my own country. One evening, as I walked home from school, I couldn't shake the feeling that I'd been watched. I quickened my pace, but the footsteps behind me seemed to grow louder. I turned to face my pursuer, my heart pounding in my chest. It was a boy, no older than me, his eyes narrowed with hostility. He wore a shirt and some ripped jeans. His face looked awful. Without a word, he lunged at me, his fist clenched. I screamed and dodged his punch, but he was relentless. He grabbed my arm and twisted it until I thought it would snap. I fought back with all my might, but he was stronger than I was. Just when I thought I was about to lose consciousness, a voice boomed from behind me. Leave her alone! I looked up to see my father charging towards us. He tackled the boy to the ground and held him there, his eyes blazing with fury. The boy struggled against his grip, but my father's determination was unyielding. Eventually, the boy gave up and slunk away his face twisted in a mixture of anger and also shame. My father helped me to my feet and hugged me tightly. I'm sorry, he whispered. I should have been there for you. In that moment, I realized that despite the challenges we faced, I wasn't alone. My father would always be there to protect me, no matter what. Over time, I began to adapt to my new life. I made a few friends, about cautiously, and learned to ignore the whispers and stares of the town's people. I found peace in books and music, creating my own world with the confines of our trailer. The girls in my town may have been different from me, but they had their own strengths and vulnerabilities. I learned to see beyond their superficial differences and to appreciate their resilience and kindness. The adults, too, had their own stories to tell. They had endured hardship and loss, but they had also found ways to survive and to create a community, however flawed it may have been. One evening, I was sat outside the trailer as I watched a sunset paint the sky. I realised that I had found a new sense of belonging, it wasn't the same as the life I'd left behind, but it was my life, and I was determined to make the best of it. The move had been a catalyst for change, both within me and my family. It had forced us to confront our fears and to grow in ways we never thought possible. As the stars twinkled above our trailer, I looked up at my father and smiled. Thank you. I said, for everything. He smiled back, his eyes filling with tears. You're welcome, sweetheart. I'm just glad we're together. In that moment, I knew that despite the challenges we had faced, we had found a new home, not just in a physical sense, 
but also in each other's hearts. Growing up in this trailer park was not easy. My dad and I had now moved to this small, run-down park on the outskirts of the town. We didn't have much, but we made the best of what we had. My dad worked long hours at the factory, and I helped out as much I could, doing odd jobs around the neighbourhood. Despite our financial struggles, my dad always made sure I had a roof over my head and food on the table. He was my hero, my best friend, and my everything. But one night, everything changed. It was a typical Friday evening in our trailer park. My dad had just finished his shift at the factory, and I was lounging on the couch, watching TV. Suddenly, I heard a knock on the door. I wasn't expecting anyone, so I cautiously made my way to the door. To my surprise, my dad was standing there with a big grin on his face. Hey kiddo, guess what? He said excitedly. What is it dad? I asked, curious about his sudden burst of energy. I've got a lady coming over this afternoon. I met her on Tinder, and she's coming over for the night. I couldn't believe it. My dad had been single ever since my mum passed away, and I'd never seen him this excited about someone. I was for happy for him, and I couldn't wait to meet this mystery woman. A few hours later, there was a knock on the door again. This time, my dad answered it, and I could hear the sound of a woman's voice. I peeked out from my room and saw my dad standing at the door with a woman by his side. She had long curly blonde hair and was wearing a tight red summer dress. My dad introduced her as Lisa and I could tell he was smitten with her. We spent the evening together, talking, laughing and getting to know each other. Lisa seemed like a nice person and I was happy that my dad had found someone to spend time with. As the night went on, my dad and Lisa became more and more affectionate, and I decided to give them space, and went to my bedroom, leaving them alone. Our trailer is separated into four rooms, which includes my bedroom, my dad's bedroom, the kitchen and living area, and then the toilet. In the middle of the night, I was awakened by a loud scream. I quickly got out of bed and ran to my dad's room, where I found him struggling with Lisa. I couldn't believe my eyes. She had a knife in her hand and was trying to drive it into my dad's neck. I had thought Lisa was a nice woman, but clearly I was wrong. Without hesitation, I charged at Lisa and tackled her to the ground, throwing her body off the bed. While I did this, my dad quickly got up, and he tried to hold her down too. She was screaming and thrashing, trying to break free from the broth of us. It was a terrifying experience, but I was determined to protect my dad. Once dad got on top of Lisa, he held her down and told me to go and call the cops. When the police arrived, they took Lisa into custody, and my dad and I were taken to the hospital to get checked for any injuries. Thankfully, we were both okay, just a little shaken up. The police told us that Lisa had a history of mental illness and had been off her medication. She had a history of violent behaviour and had been arrested before for attempted murder when she was only 15. I couldn't believe how close we'd come to losing my dad. I couldn't imagine my life without him, and the thought of someone trying to hurt him was unbearable. As we sat in the hospital waiting room, my dad held my hand and thanked me for saving his life. He told me that I was his hero, and he couldn't have been prouder of me. From that night on, our lives changed, my dad and I became even closer, and he made sure to spend more time with me, instead of going on dates, or inviting women to the trailer. We eventually got out of the trailer park, 
and we moved to a safer neighbourhood, where we didn't have to worry about our own safety every single night. My dad promised me that he would always put our well-being first, and that he would never bring someone into our lives without being sure of their intentions. Looking back on that night, I realised how much my dad had sacrificed for me. He had raised me on his own, and had always put my needs before his own. He had worked hard to provide for us, and even in the face of danger, he had remained calm and protected me. I was grateful for everything he had done for me, and I promised myself that I would always be there for him, just like he had been there for me. A few months after the incident, my dad and I were just sitting on the porch of our new home, still watching the sunset. Watching the sunset was a tradition for me and my dad. It was a way of us saying, look, it doesn't matter how bad the day has been, at the end of it, you must come and watch the sunset with me. Deal? Deal. We talked about everything that had happened, and how it had brought us closer. My dad then turned to me and said, You know, I may not have much to give you, but I'll always be here for you, no matter what. I love you. Tears welled up in my eyes. I hugged my dad tightly, knowing that he was my rock, my constant in this ever-changing world. I may not have grown up in a big house or had all the luxuries, but I had something much more valuable, the love and the support of my dad. From that day on, I made a promise to always cherish my dad and to never take him for granted. I learned that it's not about the material things in life, but the people who love and support us through it all. My dad may have not been perfect, but he was perfect to me, and I wouldn't have wanted it any other way. As the years went by, my dad and I continued to live in our lives, but it was no longer a symbol of poverty or struggle. It was a symbol of our strength, resilience, and most importantly, our love for each other. Every time I think back to the trailer days, I was reminded of the night that changed our lives and brought us closer together. I'll always be grateful for the lessons my dad taught me, and the love he showered me with. He may not have been rich, but to me, he was the richest man in the world, and I will always be proud to call him my dad. Hey guys, thank you for staying tuned until the end of this video. If you enjoyed these stories today, please be sure to subscribe and join the channel as I upload every single evening. Also, please leave a like on today's video to show your support. Here in this channel, I'm not part of a corporation, I don't have sponsorship deals and I'm not part of a YouTube network. It's just me, sat in my bedroom, with a $100 microphone. I really do work very hard on this channel, but unfortunately, there are many other horror story channels that seem to be using AI voices and stealing people's stories off of Reddit. What do I mean by this? There are forums all over Reddit where people share their creepy horror stories and their personal experiences. Many of these horror story channels on YouTube will copy and paste and steal these videos. In other words, they will just read what someone else has typed out and hope that they can get away with it. Please support channels that do not do this, and I am one of those. Another pet peeve of mine is the AI channels that use robot voices. It's important, as we get into the age of AI, that you support real-life, true hard-working channels. 
AI will make everything automated. It means that we will turn into a society with awful quality and just constant churning out of numbers. There's nothing better than a real human voice with an accent, breath, and adjectives to try and explain things in a human way. Please keep watching my videos, and if you want, comment down below your opinions, criticism, or advice for the people in these stories. Thank you everyone, and I'll catch you in tomorrow night's video.